So for today, what I'm hoping to accomplish is after a quick review of what we did last time and answer any questions, I want to get into control structures, uh, which is basically um, decision making and looping constructs. I think I'll just cover decision making constructs today and then uh, talk about what the expectations in assignment 5 are. So content wise I've uploaded some notes for you on this top hyperlink to review and there are notes on uh, all these all these subtopics. So of course you can go review those but there's going to be plenty of in-class exercises and uh, examples I'm going to cover on each one of these. And on unit H, uh, you can probably expect one more assignment uh, because we're dealing with decision-making constructs first, if statement, if else statement. And then after that, we'll be uh, looking at the looping. Um, and so we'll have uh, another assignment on loops that'll probably come due after the midterm. Um, so to just do a quick review of uh, what we did do last time, we talked about um, math functions. We also talked about how to um, how to write a function. But writing custom functions <coughs> is not yet part of any exercise. It'll be covered in detail later. I'm, I'm hoping the application of it will probably come together after the midterm. And then we talk about the fourth assignment. And so what I'll do is like to spend some time during class to help you guys out as, you know, I will start uh, setting up uh, part of the day as lab time so if you guys have problems with anything I can I can assist you so I try to front load the quarter with uh, mostly lecture but then as we progress through you guys may have questions and so you can bring those to the um, uh, to the class and I can assist you one on one any questions on things covered so far? You guys seem pretty content with whatever is happening so far? Okay, so then let me get into control structure. So control structures help execute specific parts of the program. You can execute specific parts of the program using if, if else, or else if. Else if is two words. And you can also use, um, we can execute part of uh, parts of the statement, parts of code iteratively. So you can execute it more than one time um, using loops. And we think about while, do while, and for loops. We'll cover these. Um, the loops probably as uh, part of next week. So, working with control structures is where the um, main programming happens for implementing algorithms. And what I want to do is give you guys enough practice in class through um, 
um, some of the classwork we do and also through assignments. So we can start with writing simpler programs and also get into writing more complicated ones, perhaps through by the end of the quarter. So. That will require you guys to understand how the uh, language works with these different control structures that we're going to talk about. Understanding those is pretty easy because, you know, working with this statement or for loops or while loops is more like speaking English, really. But it's the application of it and coming up with different algorithms, you know, different ways of solving complex problems. That's where you may be confronted with some hardship. And that is just a matter of practice. So, so I'm interested in first uh, looking at decision-making constructs. Decision-making control structures. And we also use the term constructs for this. So you can have these four constructs that you will end up learning in this course. If, else, else if, and switch. So, if I take a simple if statement, it will have it will have a condition and set of actions. So I can either have one condition or more, followed by um, a set of actions. So I could say, programmatically, if I want to say, if I have money, And the definition of that could be as long as money is greater than zero. It could also mean that maybe I need to keep a reserve of $100,000. So if money is greater than 100000 then I have money. So it's a definition of a condition that you come up with depending on the requirements. So if I have money, I want to go and gamble. So then this printf statement becomes one action. It, I can also, when I write my if, if statement, and when I write my conditions, uh, I can <coughs> write multiple statements. If I have more than one statement, so say in this case, I were to I were to say that I'm going to donate all the winnings. And I, and of course I want to print these in separate lines or so slash n would be a requirement. So my point is that with an if statement if I end up with more than one action, then I'm going to use the curly braces and I'll have a, a, a begin and an end. Okay? Why do we need this? Why do we need branching in our code? Why is it that we are interested in executing some parts of the code using these kind of conditions. So we can reuse the code as much as possible. It's more about reusability, so we don't have to keep writing 
same code multiple times in multiple places. So working with an if statement as you saw requires you to write a condition and set of actions. So writing a writing a condition <coughs> requires working with a relational and logical operators. So there are six relational operators that are provided to you for, for use. Um, we get greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, less than, equal to, not equal to, and equal to. So you're essentially uh, comparing two values you can either do this using identifiers or better yet using variables or constants are you familiar with the term literal a value like 4.0 f is a float literal or a value like four is an integer. So. so you could compare literals or values of variables. It's usually a good idea to compare the, when you're comparing values, to compare the same data types. But most of the times in life that cannot be supported for whatever reason because you may need to um, use different data types. So as long as you're comparing apples to apples, you're okay. Like if you're comparing an integer with a float, that's probably okay. But if you try to compare an integer, say with a string, that may not work out so well from a, uh, from a comparison perspective. So, Comparing the same data types is, is, is indeed helpful. So we declare two variables. We assign, say, a value to each. And if I say, if x is equal to y, and we just assign the value so we know the two are the same. <coughs> So if x is equal to y, then this becomes a condition. And this condition can either return true or false. So in Java, this will not be a zero or a one. It will be literally those identifiers, true or false. Those will, those will be the value. When a condition is true, then you can set up something as action. So maybe in this case, I want to um, print the value of x and y. If the two are not congruent, I can also have an else clause. And instead of printing the value of x, I'll print the value of y if the two values are unequal. I'm just writing some actions to help you visualize how this will work. So if 
my condition is true, I will print the value of x. If my condition is false, I'll print the value of y. Okay? So, a simple if statement. Condition writing is mostly dependent on these relational operators. And you have to be pretty much aware of how these relational operators do work. If you end up comparing strings, If you are comparing strings, you will be comparing the integer value of each character from left to right. So what does that mean? So if I have a string called, say, Bob, versus thing, right? I'm going to bring in, I'm going to look at the integer representation of letter B. Uppercase B, it has an integer representation and those values are often called the ASCII value. Because we want to make sure so there is this industry standard that will ensure that regardless of the different computer systems that are made, including tablets and phones and all that, that every time you type the letter A, it is, it is universal, right? And as you know, computer systems understand sequence of zeros and ones. So every letter in the alphabet or whatever you see on your keyboard is in fact converted to an integer representation. And those are called the ASCII values. So it turns out that the ASCII value of uppercase B is less than S. So we can just compare those two characters and deduce that Bob is less than same. Like if you're going through a filing system you'll need to compare strings to put those things in a specific order. And that's how string comparison works at a high level. For the purposes of our next assignment, uh, I'm not introducing anything on string comparisons yet. I'm leaving it with just numbers so you can uh, basically get good with it. And then we can deal with other complexities down the road. Any questions so far? So we were on the topic of writing conditions and we talked about relational operators and we talked about six of these and you all know what how these work value value comparison wise and for each of the values when compared the thing will either return true or false <coughs> so. we can go ahead and write multiple conditions in one statement and that's where we use the logical operators So this is a this is an AND operator, this is an OR operator, and this is the NOT operator. The purpose of logical operators is so we can compare two conditions together. 
So if you want to write some larger conditional senten sentences, then we can do that using the logical operator. So in, in language, we might say, uh, if I have money and I have a car, then it's time to hit the casino. Not that that's the best thing, but it's just an example. So, according to my definition of money, so let me declare money and let me set money to like $10,000. And let me say it, set a Boolean variable, and we'll call it car, and I'll set that to true. Every time a variable is declared, it is your responsibility to initialize it. Especially if it's a local variable, meaning a variable that you declare in main or inside a function. So if money is greater than 100,000, and I have a car, then I can copy this thing down and I can maybe break off I can have these two I can have these two conditions put together. Please take note from the syntax standpoint that when I said money is greater than 10,000 with an and I started using parentheses as you see here. I must I must do that for multiple conditions in Java. I cannot write a or from a good convention perspective, I should not write the code like that, where I just have two conditions that are hanging in air. It's imperative to put this in brackets. Now, when an AND operator is used like this, it, it pretty much acts like, it acts like the AND word in English, meaning, the first condition is true and the second condition is true, both are true, then we are going to carry out these actions. Otherwise, we are not. Okay? So this is how we look at it technically. That if I have two conditions, condition one and condition two, and I were to assert the result by looking at both of the outcomes of the conditions, then this is what's possible. If condition one is true and second is true, then the result of those two conditions would be true. We can have first condition true and second condition false. <clears throat> With an AND operator, the result will be false. So in this particular case, since the money is less than 100,000, there is no chance I'm off to the casino. So none of this will get printed out. If the first condition is false, the second condition is true, the result will be false. And finally we have if both conditions are false, then the result is not executed. So statements are only executed when the result is result of the two <coughs> 
and operation is true. So, if either one of them is false, then the result ends up being false. So now if the first condition is false right here, do I even need to evaluate the second condition? Because I know that the result is false, right? So, so he, in such situations, Second condition is not evaluated. So what does that mean? This is called short circuiting. So this can be a good exam question. What is the concept of short circuiting? And the idea is when the first condition is false in an AND evaluation, the need to evaluate the second condition is not there. So we call that short circuit. Now, if we were working with an OR operator, life would be a little bit different. And we'll, we will look at that in a moment. Now, when you look at this detailed setup, see, for the most part, you have to do this in your head. And you don't have the luxury of doing this on pen and paper. So, so there is generally a, a statement one can make about AND operators, which is what? That if all conditions are true, the result will be executed. That's it. And if any one of the conditions is false, forget about the results uh, evaluation. So. so that's the usage of the AND operator. Am I going too slow? Or is everyone okay? Anyone bored? We can swim faster if you would like. Probably okay. All right. Let's look at the OR operator next. <clears throat> so OR operator refers to either one of the conditions is true, then the result is true. So we can say if condition one or condition two, then actions. Pending whatever conditions you're gonna end up thinking of or end up writing. I want to talk about short circuiting with the OR operator as well. So, if one of the conditions is true, the result is true. So, wherever you see the result as true, that's where the statement is executed or the set of actions that are described are executed. So short circuiting, will I, is there a need for me to evaluate the second condition 
if the first condition is true, do I even care about the second condition result? Because I know that as long as one condition is true, right, I can basically cal uh, calculate the result to be true and execute the action. So I'm going to have short circuiting with OR operator here. So in, in, in a situation here, the second condition is not even evaluated. And the same thing happens here as well. So when the first condition is true, I don't even evaluate the second condition. So. And then I have the NOT operator. which is basically the inverse of <coughs> true or false. So the NOT operator, oh sorry, I forgot to tell you about the OR operator, how it's set up, it's a double pipe symbol, like shift backslash on your keyboard, if our keyboards are the same, which they should be. And the NOT operator is the exclamation mark. So I can say, if I have money, not, meaning if I have more than a thousand bucks, and if I wanted to inverse the result of that, then I could do something like this. And I can define, I can define a, a set of actions. So this is, looking at the NOT operator. If money is greater than 1000, NOT actions. So let me call this action one, declare money here, and I'll say money is 5000. Am I going to execute action one? <coughs> It's the inverse of that condition. So we're gonna say 5,000 is greater than 1,000, which means what? True. And not of true is false. Therefore, the result is not executed. The control is given to after my if else block. And I'm gonna execute the second condition. I mean, second action, excuse me, okay? So what we have done so far, folks, is looked at relational and logical operators. We've also talked about the idea of short circuiting with both um, AND and OR operators. So now it's time to put this to practice in class. So let me do this. We'll work together to write a small game in class. So So an example is a guessing game. Have you guys ever played the guessing game? So the game is, it kind of goes like this. So you think of a number between one and 100. And I should be able to guess the number in your head in seven or less tries. And this is a this is a game with a strategy. It's not like uh, it's not with a with a trick, right? There's no such there are no tricks. So we'll apply the logic. So does anybody want to play this game to see if I can really 
guess the number that might be in your head. How do you, how do you play? I'll show you, man. Yeah. And then, so we'll, we'll play and then we'll code it. And we'll do, it, we'll do that together. So I think I have a volunteer and your name is? Ali. Huh? Ali. Ali. All right, Ali. Think of a number between 1 and 100. Right. And don't tell me. <laughs> because the point is I'm supposed to guess it. Okay? So here is, here is the strategy. I'm going, my first guess is 50. Is the number 50? No. Is it higher or lower? It's lower. It's lower, he says. So my next guess My next guess is, any guesses about my next guess? 25. It's going to be 25. So Ali, what do you think? Did I get it? It's lower. It's lower. So my next guess is? Thirteen. Right? Ali, you're not changing the number on me, are you, Ali? No. <laughs> All right. So now my next guess is between 14 and? Because I said is the number 25, so he said no. So it must be between what? 14 and 24. 14 and 24. Now I take the average of that. Is it 19? Okay, is that the number? I bet you he's changing the number on me, guys. <laughs> he's insisting it's higher than 19, but lower than 24. Right? My next guess is? 22. You guys are good at this. It is higher, he says. So it must be? 23. Ali, come on, man. Michael Jordan. What Michael Jordan? Oh, that's his number, 23. Aha, okay. That was, see, you should have told me that before. I would have gotten it, you know. So what if it says, it's higher or lower? It's higher. What if it's like 23.5? Well, that will not, that'll take a few more to retries. Right. I cannot get into fractions. So, it's a number between 1 and 100, and yes, in my game I should have been clear. Ali, think of whole numbers only. And fortunately, Ali followed that rule without me saying. So that wasn't bad, right? So that's how you guess. You get it? You basically keep looking. At, it's like going through the phone book, looking for something, right? You can use this strategy. You can start in the middle and go to left or right. But the, the thing is that you have to compute the average. So, so can you take? A few minutes to come up with a design strategy for this. So the gaming strategy is in front of you. And I would like you guys to design this. So I want to give you guys 10 minutes in class to think about it and then we will code it together. So design is what steps will the program take to guess the number that the player has thought about? So in other words, Ali is the user of this game. Ali was having a conversation with me earlier and in the role of the game, it should replace me. And it should do all that work. So it should say, 
Think of a number between 1 and 100. Don't type the number because I'm going to guess it. And then add it. Is the number 50? Well, okay, is it higher or lower? Lower. Is the number 25? Higher or lower? Lower. Is the number 30? And so on. So what is the, what are the steps that need to be taken for designing this program? And that's what I want you guys to please spend about 10 minutes on and then we will sit down and code this together. Yeah? I want some guidance from you guys. How will you go about attacking this uh, problem and solving it? Ten minutes. <laughs> 